All right, we're ready for a demonstration. How about you? This is going to be an experiment. I'm trying some new technology today. That's kind of a scary sounding thing, but one of the things we're going to look at together uh, will be some photography information that'll help you in your wood turning. Now, at first, that sounds like a contradiction. How can photography help you with your wood turning? But I think you'll see some uh, ways that might be possible. I've had quite a few people talking with me and asking questions about uh, cameras, photography, how to take better pictures of their finished products, and some problems they're having with photographing things in the workshop. This hopefully will answer some of those questions, and it'll also give you a chance to uh, participate in this um, session. We're going to try to field your questions through the chat window. If you have that chat um, screen available, I know different devices do those um, connections differently, but if you have a question during some of our time, if you unmute and talk, I'll probably be able to hear you. I hope I will, but if not, type a question in the chat box and I'll try to keep one eye on those um, questions as they come in. And so today we're going to talk about several different things. Uh, we're going to, there we go, I'll move my smiling face out of the way there. Uh, I don't have a, uh, a video editor and technician and field support person helping me here. I'm it. So I should have called my wife into this, but I annoyed her enough this week. And so I'll try to do this on my own. But if I'm uh, blocking the view of something, please tell me and we'll try to correct that. But some of the topics we're going to talk about today, um, first of all, we'll introduce myself a bit as a photographer and talk about then some uh, things you've asked about, things about cameras, tripods, those sorts of things. And then uh, probably one of the most important things will be how to use that camera to its best advantage. Camera settings and some of the technical buzzwords that tend to overwhelm people when they're new to photography. Uh, we'll talk some about composition, won't dwell on that too much, but it uh, very well uh, mirrors what you do in wood turning. When we talk about rule of thirds and things like that, and it's very similar to what we've already talked about in past demonstrations having to do with designing a vessel, how you put the um, curves of that vessel at the uh, um, appropriate points for best um, uh, design. We'll talk about two types or two areas of photography regarding um, wood turning. One is what I call process photography. I like to document my wood turning processes by taking photos. I can't remember what type of clamping setup I used on that last segmented vessel I made, but I have photographs and some documentation that I've stored to help me remember those things. And then also I'll show you my studio setup so you can see how I take pictures of the finished products that I've made. But before we get off into that, I should make an official introduction of myself and prove to you that I do have credentials as a photographer. Well, they're, they're kind of uh, lightweight credentials, but nonetheless, I have a few. Um, the picture you see there is me when I was just a few months shy of three years old. I'd already started to get a fascination with cameras and whatever photography equipment I could find. Um, kind of looks like, um, reminded me of Jimmy Olsen getting ready to go to work at the Daily Planet. And if you don't know that reference, you need to watch more Superman movies from the 40s and 50s. Anyway, I did have a little formal training in high school. I took a, a photography class in the art department. Mostly what I did there was darkroom work, black and white uh, film developing and printing. Um, did quite a bit of that, learned a little bit about camera operation and so forth. Um, really didn't do any more formal training uh, per se, but um, years later, I was a 4-H project leader for the uh, County 4-H photography project. And I'll do a little bragging here because that's what uh, presenters do when they introduce themselves. But our Sling County 4-H uh, photography project group um, sent a team to the Kansas State Fair 
and we were the first place team twice. Two years we placed first in the state, and that's up against 30 some other teams from all over the state. Uh, two of my sons, I only have two sons, my two sons um, both earned first place individual rankings in various years out of about 100 participants. And so I felt real proud of that. I felt that I'd given them some knowledge and understanding of photography that gave them that um, uh, opportunity to succeed. And I've done other photography presentations to church groups. Um, Saline County um, Horticulture Club had a group of members that wanted a photography demo for photographing flowers. Um, basically, what you'll see today is some recycled presentation stuff that I gave years ago to a horticulture club. And I've done, um, you know, well, I guess I even did a, a short training session for our marketing staff at K-State Salina on how to use the photo equipment that they had. So I've done a few things, um, know a little bit about photography, and now I've proven it to you officially. So uh, let's go on about uh our business and talk about why would we want to learn photography anyway. Um, one of the things that we like to do is share what we've done in the wood turning world. And whether you share stuff on Instagram or Twitter, Facebook, whatever, uh, you probably posted pictures out there of what you're doing. Many of us have uh, uh, been asked to submit photos to the local newspaper or perhaps you're aspiring to publish something in the AAW journal. Um, certainly, if you're wanting to apply to galleries, the first thing they'll ask for is photographs of your work. And there it's important to show your very best um, work and the very best way you display that through good photography. And then finally, what I like to do, as I mentioned before, is document my work so I can figure out how to do that again someday. And so those are some of the things that uh, we'll try to hit upon here as we talk this morning. And so we're going to uh, look at several pieces of equipment. One, I want to uh, kind of compare and contrast the different kind of cameras you might have or might wish to have. Um, if you're shopping for a camera, I can give you some pointers. Uh, if you already have a camera and want to know more, hopefully I can answer those questions too. But the three main categories we'll consider here, um, your cell phone camera. That's one that uh, has some advantages we'll talk about. Uh, the next category would be the so-called digital point and shoot cameras. And then finally, the more sophisticated digital single lens reflex or DSLR cameras. Um, the one in the picture is my DSLR that I use for most of the things that I'm doing. Um, most all the photographs you see in this presentation, I shot with either that camera or my cell phone. And so you'll um, learn the pros and cons of each of those here as we proceed. Now, the first type of camera that I think everybody um, is familiar with these days is the cell phone camera. And the cell phone camera is one that's got some real advantages. For one, it's convenient. How many times in years past before I had a cell phone with a camera did I wish for that camera was, I wish the camera was with me. Well, now I usually have that thing in my pocket if I only remember to take it out and snap a picture with it. Um, they're convenient. The new phones have much better optics than the early ones did but the limitations are also quite uh, significant. I really, really don't like my cell phone camera because it limits what I can do. It does not give me what I call creative control over the subject that I'm shooting. It's very convenient, but it's also very limiting in many ways. But nonetheless, it's uh, uh, a tool that's available in my pocket most of the time. Cell phones are, not cheap. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, oh, it only costs $25 a month. $25 a month, do some math. $25 a month over the three-year contract, or even, a, I've even seen five-year contracts now, but three-year contracts, three years, 25 a month, that's $900. You can find a really nice camera for $900. 
And to be honest, that phone that you're so proud of now, it'll be obsolete. And I'll, I'll guarantee it'll be obsolete in five or six years. As a personal example, cell phone on the left, that's an iPhone 6. I bought that six and a half years ago. The one on the right, that's my current phone, my iPhone 13 Pro. Why did I buy that? It's not that I wanted a camera. I've got a nice camera. I bought that because my iPhone 6 at age six, well, is about at six years, Apple quit supporting that phone with new operating system updates. Well, that doesn't sound too serious, but that means you can't uh, have the latest security um, uh, patches and things like that. But also many of the apps that you have on your phone will not run if you don't have the current operating system. And little by little, you know, first it was my bank app that I used to scan and deposit checks remotely. It quit working. And then this app quit and this app quit. And pretty soon, yeah, it still made phone calls, but most of the apps were becoming worthless. And so I bit the bullet and said, OK, I'll buy a new phone. I opted for one with the better optics, the, the camera with uh, three lenses and all that. But it was forced obsolescence that made me switch to a new phone. Anyway, those are some of the pros and cons of the cell phone cameras. But nonetheless, we'll, we'll talk about how we can use those in our Wood turning photography here in a bit. Um, the point and shoot camera is another uh, step in the progression of cameras that you could get. Um, we have one here or a group of them here in these pictures. Those are typical of what you get. Some of those are really nice cameras. I, I don't have one anymore. Actually, I gave my uh, kind of old uh, point and shoot camera to my grandson. So he's now becoming a photographer. But anyway, point and shoot cameras have some pretty good creative control uh, features. Uh, some of the better models at least do. They're, they're compact, they can fit into your, I don't know about your pocket. I suppose they could fit in a pocket in some cases or your purse or backpack. And they're fairly moderately priced, meaning, well, gee, even for slightly less than a hundred bucks, you can get a fairly decent camera. Most of the better ones are going to cost you somewhere between $100 and $300. One of the downsides, they lack a few of the features that the big DSLRs will have. One of the main features it lacks would be the interchangeable lenses. Kind of limits you in some ways. But uh, nonetheless, those are uh, nice cameras you might want to consider if you're shopping for one. And then finally, the um, step that comes next is the DSLR. Um, the big advantage compared with cameras we've already talked about is um, the one that we've mentioned earlier with interchangeable lenses. Now you can have a wide angle lens, a fisheye lens, a long telephoto. You can attach it to a microscope. You can do all kinds of things with that camera body hooking it up to a different lens. Uh, gives you a lot of creative control and flexibility with what you do. This is a photo of my um, uh, uh, DSLR, my Canon EOS 80D is the model number. That one is no longer in production. Um, Canon, most camera manufacturers come out with new models about every three or four years. This one was superseded by a new model called the 90D has a few more bells and whistles. Yeah, I'd like to have it, but it's not a deal breaker. I'm not going to trade. This camera is about four and a half years old, does not have anything that is making it obsolete, no operating system to go um, obsolete on me. I have a predecessor to this camera, a Canon 40D, that is 14 years old, and it still works great. Now it will not take movies. It will not. It does not have a touch screen and some of the nice features this AD has. But nonetheless, it is still a very capable camera in its own right. So I have two DSLRs, and each one I uh, use for different purposes. Anyway, on the downside, DSLRs, yeah, they're expensive. 
I, I looked up prices just this morning. My, my Canon 80D, you can actually still buy new models. They're still on the dealer's shelves. They're just not in current production. And so you can, you can still buy one. Um, that camera with a, a, an introductory um, zoom lens will run around $1,000. Um, the new Canon 90D, it'll run about $1,200 for its uh, uh, basic lens um, kit, as they call them. They call them a kit lens. Um, the learning curve is the other downside of a DSLR. There are so many features that you'll be overwhelmed by them if you're new to photography. But don't despair. There's some ways to set that camera in, I hate to say dummy mode, but yeah, for a real simple introduction, you can set it in a mode that lets it be more or less a point and shoot camera. Um, we'll talk about a lot of those buzzwords here this morning, and hopefully by the end of the session, you'll be a little more confident with uh, understanding those things. Uh, the picture I have on the screen there includes the, the top dial on my uh, uh, camera, as well as one of the menus on the little LCD screen on the back of the camera. There are, I, sh I should have counted them, probably 15 or 20 different LCD menu screens. Yeah, there's that many settings that you can um, adjust and manipulate in this camera. So it does take some getting used to. It's not a quick and easy thing, but there are, um, well, dozens, if not hundreds of tutorials out there on YouTube and elsewhere on how to learn and, and fully utilize that camera. So the learning curve is one issue. The, the other one, of course, they're big, bulky, and heavy. They're uh, not ones that you would pack and uh, um, take with you in your pocket. It's not going to work that way. You have to be serious about lugging around a camera, typically in a camera bag or a, uh, some protective gear to carry it around while you're hiking. But nonetheless, it's uh, uh, one that gives you a lot of creative control and certainly my go-to camera of choice. Now, we're gonna talk about some of the basic features of a camera, and some of you will be bored stiff because you already know this. Some of you will be overwhelmed and saying, I don't wanna know this, I wanna point and shoot, and I don't care about all these things, but I think this will help you understand how your pictures are turning out the way they are and how you can improve them using some of these um, creative controls. We'll talk about some things that control the exposure in the camera, the shutter speed, the aperture, ISO, and color balance. And we'll talk about each one of those individually to um, help you get the most out of that camera. The uh, first one we're going to talk about is shutter speed. Now, shutter speed is going to affect the amount of light reaching the sensor. And before we get off into the technical nitty gritty, I'm going to use some analogies here that hopefully will make sense to you. On a cold morning like this, if you open the door and it's, well, we're assuming it's cold outside. Uh, you open the door, it's cold, you want to get out quick so you're not letting a lot of cold air into the house. You zip out, slam the door behind you real quick, and that minimizes the amount of cold getting into the house. Now, on a nice sunny day when it's warm, you may more uh, casually amble out the door, open it, take a nice deep breath, enjoy that uh, spring air, and then close the door slowly behind you. Well, that analogy is the same as a shutter in a camera. Sometimes we want to let in very little light. Sometimes we want to let in a lot of light to that camera. There's a sensor inside that camera that we're um, exposing with light. We used to expose film back in the olden days, but now we expose an electronic sensor. And so our sensor is going to be exposed to light and the scale or this picture, yeah, there's my cursor. This picture shows the shutter speed settings in my particular camera. They range from a really fast one eight thousandth of a second down to, there's a whole bunch of them I didn't print there, but down to up to 30 seconds of exposure time. And so that's how long that shutter is open to the light coming in from the outside. 
Now, a fast shutter speed is what you would want to use if you were photographing a moving subject. Think about going to the racetrack and you want to photograph some speeding cars or horses or whatever you race. Um, that would be a shutter speed that would freeze the action and give you the best uh, sharp image of that um, subject in motion. Now, a slow shutter speed, like one fifteenth of a second or certainly 30 seconds, that's going to blur the action. And somewhere in between is probably the sweet spot that you'll want to set your camera for most picture taking. I should point out that every step in that progression of shutter speeds is a multiple of two. One one thousandth of a second is twice the exposure time as is one two thousandth of a second. And here I'll probably make some math uh, anxiety kick in, but don't worry, this isn't that complicated. Just remember, those are factors of two that are used to um, adjust the shutter speed. Now, the next thing, oh, I need to move my, move my face out of the way there. Hold on while I do that. I have two monitors. And for what I'm doing with this software, I really ought to have three. But anyway, I'll get there. I need to grab and move and switch. There we go. All right. Now, a lens aperture or f-stop. That's how big, well, go back to our silly um, opening and closing the door analogy. The f-stop or aperture you can think of as how big is that door. A big door is going to let in a lot of cold air. A small door is going to let in much less cold air. And so the aperture or diaphragm in the lens is what's going to affect how much light hits that sensor. Now the f-stop number is technically, you don't need to know this, but it's the ratio of the focal length, how long is the optical path in that lens, to how big is that opening. And that's the uh, so-called f-stop number. And again, in this chart, each step represents one f-stop change, which is one factor of two um, amount of light. Well, for example, F2, way up at the top, lets in twice as much light as does F2.8. And that lets in twice as much light as F4, and so on and so forth. The uh, effect is used in conjunction with the shutter to get the proper amount of exposure um, onto that sensor, I guess is the way to say that. Um, the other thing the aperture does, it affects what we call the depth of field in a photograph. Now, the depth of field, by definition, is the distance between the closest and the farthest away object that are going to be acceptably sharp in your photograph. A small, arc, small aperture will uh, create a large depth of field. In other words, you'll see things in focus from front to back over a long distance, while a large aperture will have a shallow depth of field. I'm gonna show lots of examples here in just a moment, but we'll use that to selectively blur the background. Now, I'm gonna give you another of my goofy analogies, but I think this will help you understand. Some of you, not all of you, but some of you know what it's like to wear eyeglasses. If you're nearsighted like me, if I were to take my glasses off and say, look up at the wall to see the clock, to see what time it is, I can't read that. I have to squint to see what time it is. Now, what am I doing when I'm squinting? I'm reducing the aperture of my optical system. By squinting, I'm making a very small, in fact, you can do it with your finger. If, if you don't wear glasses, if you take your finger and make a little tiny hole to look through, you can actually see things get sharper. If you don't have your glasses on, you can simulate eyeglasses by holding your hands up to your eyes, I guess, 
and looking through a small aperture. That gives you a, a wider or a deeper depth of field. And we can use that to our advantage when we shoot photos in the workshop and um, general photos as well. So let me show you here a couple examples. Here's a picture I shot of a, a bowl in, in my lathe, um, tool rest sitting there. I focused on the tool rest and on, well, on the bowl or tool rest, I'm not sure, but I'm more or less focused on one of those. And you'll notice the background is out of focus. Uh, also, I see this guy sitting in front of the picture here. Move him out of the way. There we go. This is a large aperture I shot this with. This particular lens I was using, its biggest aperture was f4.5. This was a, uh, a telephoto lens, and I used that to get the perspective that I wanted in the picture. Um, anyway, you don't need to know about that. f4.5 is a very large aperture. Notice how out of focus the background is. Yeah, you can still see that it's probably the top of my cluttered workbench and there's some yellow stuff and white stuff and uh, wood grain colored stuff back there, but you can't tell what it is. But if I go to this next picture, here's the same vantage point, the camera's pointing in the same direction, only this time I'm using a very small aperture. This particular one is f36, a very small aperture. And notice, even though I'm focused on that tool rest, that can of seal coat shellac back there is in sharp focus, the wood, the other junk on my bench, that's all in sharp focus. Now, we can selectively use that um, uh, aperture to control the image. If you're trying to minimize what the viewer sees in the background, you don't want them to see that you're using seal coat brand shellac. You just want that to be obscured. You need to force your camera to use a big aperture. And that's part of that creative control that I mentioned before. Small aperture, large depth of field, big aperture, very little depth of field. Okay, is that making sense? Doing okay? Another example. Here's a typical shot that people complain about. I've had people say, well, I took this picture and my camera focused, I think. Your camera, if you have a camera, it's probably got autofocus. Your cell phone has an autofocus system. It is not the smartest machine in the world and it'll focus on whatever it thinks the subject is. In this case, the camera focused on the back rim of the bowl, not the front rim of the bowl. Okay, now this is again an example. I used f2.8 for this particular lens. That was its largest aperture. Notice we've got a very shallow depth of field here. The front is not focused, but the back of the scene is. Now, if we try another shot, here we've focused on the front rim of the bowl. The back rim is out of focus. Now, that may be just fine. Maybe you don't want to see the detail inside the bowl. But maybe I do. And if I do, well, the only option I have is to get over here and switch to this picture. And here we see that we now have a bowl that's focused on the front edge as well as on the back edge. And why is that? Well, I used a very small aperture. In this case, I'm using f22, which was the smallest aperture on that particular lens that I was using. So small aperture gives you a greater depth of field. I'll give you a hint also, when you're shooting um, like a, a subject like this, a bowl or a vessel, the best way to focus on that is don't focus on the front edge or the back edge, but the rule of thumb is to shoot about a third of the way back into that scene, about where my cursor is pointing, if you can still see that. That's where you want to focus. And then if you've got that small aperture, you can see a nice sharp image from front to back. Um, 
most SLRs, DSLRs are now called, I'm still in the film days when SLR was the buzzword. Anyway, most DSLRs have a button you can push to preview for that lens setting that you're using. It will preview what the depth of field looks like. So you'll be able to see the final picture much like this to see if the front edge and the back edge are acceptably sharp. Okay, so some things about depth of field all relating back to the aperture of your lens. This has nothing to do with shutter speed. Shutter speed won't affect how sharp that picture is in terms of where you focused. Shutter speed will, though, affect how sharp it is based on shaking and vibration of the camera. And we'll talk more about that here later. Well, while I had that on the um, background I was shooting, I had to have some fun. You know, I've got to have fun with this uh, photography stuff. So I shut off all the room lights. And just for grins, I turned on my cell phone camera, not my camera, my flashlight, and held it straight above the bowl. This was an open segment bowl that I'd made, and it cast some cool shadow patterns. And I thought, what a neat picture. And well, at least I thought it was neat. Uh, it's all in the eyes of the beholder, but you can get some cool effects by playing with the lighting there when you're uh, shooting in your studio. And we'll see more uh, adventures in the studio here shortly. So that was just for fun. Now back to the example in the workshop again. If you're shooting at a, a foreground object, background object, sometimes even though you've got a large aperture, the background still is enough in focus that it's really, really bothersome. And so one of the things we're going to have to do is figure out, well, either I need to clean up my shop, which that ain't going to happen, or I'm going to have to put some kind of fake background back here to cover that up. And so what I'm going to show you is some ways we can make that happen. Remember that if we use that um, large aperture here i focused on the background versus the foreground the background you can see clearly the words on that cardboard box and all that stuff the foreground is out of focus if i switch to a small aperture that's not going to solve my junky office or <laughs> office yeah i've got a junky office too but it's not going to solve my junky workshop problem but here I focused about a third of the way back in the scene. And that's about where this whole round thing is. That's a little table thing on my drill press. I focused on that, which kept the foreground and the background reasonably sharp for a picture that shows all those details, even though I really don't want all those details. Now we'll talk about some background manipulation here in a little bit. And then you'll see what we can do to clean that up. Um, while we're on the subject of shutter and aperture uh, details, let's look at an example. I want to make sure this is making sense to you. If we have a setting on our camera, uh, and I said here, let's make that f8 uh, and one one, I'm sorry, one two fiftieth of a second. That is exactly the same exposure as we would have if we cut the. Um, aperture in half went down to f11 in size and increased the shutter speed to 1 1 25th of a second. Now you've got to think about fractions a little bit. 1 1 25th is a bigger number than is 1 2 50th. Uh, 1 1 25th is twice as big as 1 2 50th and on our little f-stop chart f8 is twice as big as f11. So those two combinations yield exactly the same amount of light that will hit that sensor. Okay, so you may have to play around with the math and the numbers on the scale a bit, but um, I think you'll uh, get the idea. We'll uh, use that to our advantage all the time when we're adjusting our camera for the best uh, um, focus and the best photo in general. Now, a couple other points that I'll make here before we move on to some actual shooting in the workshop is 
a feature or a, a setting called ISO. Now ISO um, is an acronym for International Standards Organization. They define how sensitive is a given camera sensor to light. Um, you old timers out there may still remember ASA, which was the standards organization. That was American Standards Association back before 1974, when this became an international standard. Well, ASA, we used to talk about ASA 200 film back in the film camera days. Well, sensitivity to light is what that number defines. We would talk about film speed, and now we, I've never heard anybody call it sensor speed, but maybe they still do, I don't know. Anyway, film speed was an indication of how uh, sensitive that light or that film was to light. A film that had a speed of 100 is a film that's not very sensitive, where one that say up here in the upper range, uh, say 8,000 speed film is extremely sensitive to light. And that um, uh, speed is going to be um, used in conjunction with our calculations for shutter speed and aperture to get the right exposure. Now, there are some downsides. You might say, well, why don't we just always shoot with the highest speed? Wouldn't that be best? Not necessarily, because these real high speeds tend to introduce some digital noise or kind of graininess. Uh, some people call them artifacts into the image. You may have seen images that are pixelated. You can see the individual digital pixels in them. Sometimes that's because of shooting that image at a very high speed um, uh, to get a uh, result. But anyway, ISO is a setting that will be used. In um, many cases, though, you'll be using one of the medium ISO settings. I usually shoot at, say, 400 to 6 or 800. That's kind of the range that you won't have digital artifacts, you won't have the graininess, but it's still fast enough or sensitive enough that you can shoot pictures indoors, you can shoot pictures outdoors, you have a pretty wide range of lighting conditions you can shoot in. Now, we're going to talk about one more setting, and then I promise you we're going to get off this um, technical detail track and on to something else. Um, we're just hitting some of the main ones, I warn you. We're liable to find a lot more if we look into our camera manual. We will see here that white balance is the way we set the camera to get the correct color rendition. Um, you've probably all been to the store and bought a light bulb. And if you buy light bulbs, um, you know that if you buy a warm white bulb, it will have a different color than if you buy a bulb that has a daylight rating. Uh, how many times have you done that? You need a 60 watt equivalent bulb, you put it into the, the light fixture and oh gee, it's blue compared with the other ones and they're kind of yellow color. And so you have to look at the package and see one's a warm white, one's a cool white or it's a whatever daylight bulb, those colors are measured and defined by uh, something that's often on the package of light bulbs. It's called a color temperature. Color temperature is measured in Kelvin and you'll see 5000 K, for example, typically is what's used to describe a daylight bulb. 2700 K is what's used to describe a warm white bulb. Well, why do we need to know that? Well, your camera needs to know what kind of light that you're using to expose your subject. If you're shooting pictures of your bowls or vessels in the studio, well, are those 5,000K lamps or are those 3,000K lamps? It makes a difference to the camera in terms of what that image will look like. So each of the cameras that you'll use, even the point and shoots, will have a white balance setting. There's often, um, in, in my camera, uh, the Canon company uses AWB to indicate automatic white balance. That is the kind of figure it out automatically setting. 
if you know exactly what color light you're shooting under, like if I know I'm shooting under incandescent light bulbs in a workshop, well, you can set it at tungsten and expect the lighting to be just right. You can even set, uh, in my camera, I can even set a custom color balance because right now in the room I'm in, I've got some lights that are fluorescent. I've got some that are LED. I've got, I don't know, I probably have some incandescence in here too, but that's a mixture of light colors. You can actually customize the setting by taking a picture of a white card or piece of paper, if you will, and the camera then can figure out, oh, if that's supposed to be white, I'm seeing all these various colors. I'll make the color setting 3972 Kelvin, and it automatically sets that color balance for you. But if you don't set it right, you'll end up with something like this. And I'm sure you've seen this where the picture shows up and you thought, I thought this was a good exposure and everything, but here it's got everybody looking really yellow or everybody looking really blue and it shouldn't look that way. The upper picture, I didn't do this on purpose. This was not staged. I was trying to shoot a picture of my camera with its protective cover on it. And instead of the right color balance setting, I had it set incorrectly and it turned out much too warm or yellow and so i corrected that set it at the correct color balance and it came out white uh, for the background like the lower picture did and so that's the effect that color balance will have in shooting your pictures okay one more set of dials and switches to th think about and that's the um, ones that I've shown here. This is the top button or knob on my camera that uh, talks about exposure modes. And it lets you set modes that range from fully manual, where I have to set everything having to do with shutter speed and aperture and ISO and all those other things, to fully automatic. Uh, in fact, in the Canon cameras, there's a little green uh, indicator right there, if you can see that. That's the automatic mode. And a lot of people call that the green square mode if you're shooting a Canon camera. The green square mode is basically putting that camera into a point and shoot mentality. I never use that. I will not allow myself to use that because I want to control how the camera focuses and uh, uh, sets all the various parameters. Anyway, um, the other modes on this dial are programmed aperture priority and shutter priority. Um, program mode is one I use for most general shooting. If I go outside to take pictures of uh, wildlife or whatever, I'll use programmed mode. And in that mode, uh, you set the ISO and the color balance and let the camera figure out an appropriate range of shutter and shutter speeds and aperture settings. That's uh, for general shooting. Now, as you'll see, when I go into the workshop or into the studio to shoot pictures of wood turning, I usually use something other than those first ones I mentioned. The one I use is called aperture priority. Aperture priority means just that. The aperture takes priority over the shutter or anything else. I'm going to force the aperture to be f22 so I can get a good wide range of uh, or wide depth of field or i'm going to force the aperture to be uh, f2 to be a very large aperture and very shallow depth of field if i want to kick that background out of focus okay and so you'll hear me talking about setting your camera for aperture priority if you can if you have that option uh, that's one that we'll be using quite often well, I probably overwhelmed you with camera jingles and buzzwords and things there. Any questions? Are we doing okay? I don't see any questions in the chat box, which either means it's frozen or you've all left. I don't know. Are we doing okay? Let's see a thumbs up, somebody. Yeah, it's great, David. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about another piece of equipment that really is not absolutely essential but it's uh, a very very 
important thing if you're trying to do serious photography work um, in the studio or even in your workshop, and that's tripods. Um, most people think of tripods as being something you use to keep the camera from shaking. Well, that's exactly right. It does. You put it on, put your camera on a tripod. It'll steady that camera and keep it from shaking and keep the uh, resulting picture from being blurred. But it also does another thing for us. It lets you free up your hands so you can control other things. Um, if you're trying to um, photograph a piece of wood turning, you may be trying to hold that piece just at the right angle and you may be trying to adjust things just right so it will be uh, positioned correctly and you may have to hold the light so it's just right and you don't have three hands but a tripod can take over and do a lot of that for you the other way a tripod is handy is that i almost always shoot with a self timer on my camera and that keeps me from when i push the shutter button shutter release button that keeps me from wiggling the camera or bumping the tripod with my foot or something like that and causing camera shake and so you need a tripod if you're going to do um, self timer type photos as well um, most of you or many of you may have used a self timer on a camera so you could have a group picture with you in it um, some cameras have a little remote control gizmo. You shoot at the camera. Uh, mine has one of those, but also I can just push the button for 10 second delay and run around to the front of the camera, stand there and get my picture taken. But it also has a two second delay timer, which is nice for most things I do in the studio. I'll push the self timer for two seconds, get my hands off the tripod and away from the camera, and it'll take the picture and we're done, rock solid, no camera shake. Um, tripods are also available for cell phones, believe it or not, and I'll show you one of those here shortly. Um, and so even though you don't have a tripod socket, a little screw in hole in the bottom of your camera into which the tripod attaches, you can still use a tripod with that cell phone of yours. Um, the uh, other thing I'll show you here in a minute, a little quick video clip of different tripods and some of the features that they have if you're um, wanting to go shopping for one. Uh, they come in a wide price range and we'll see here in a minute they have features that uh, range all over the place. So um, I think without further ado, let's see if we can kick in this video. Get my face off this get my face off the screen first so you won't be watching me in front of the video. That's never fun. So hold on while I start the video. The first tripod I'm going to show you is one that came bundled with some other camera equipment I purchased. It was a freebie, in other words, and as the old adage goes, you get what you pay for. I'll show you why. Setup for this tripod is rather straightforward. First, you snap the leg sections in place and lock that little knob. <clears throat> Next, to extend the leg, you loosen that clip and pull out the telescoping leg sections. And once they're extended and that clip is locked, then they're locked in place. So that part is rather quick and straightforward. The center post raises and lowers using this crank on the side. And that is rather cumbersome. They tried to replicate what the professional video photographers use in Hollywood, uh, except they didn't succeed very well. Anyway, that's how the tripod raises and lowers. This has what's called a pan tilt head. It pans along that axis, of course, and tilts by loosening this knob and tilting in this way. And then in this other axis, we can loosen that knob and then tilt this way to put your camera into portrait mode versus landscape mode. And so those are the features. Best features, of course, are that it's very light and portable. 
That's the only good feature I can think of for this tripod because look, it's so wobbly. I wouldn't put any camera on there that weighs very much. I certainly wouldn't put my big DSLR on there. I might attach my cell phone. I might attach a small point and shoot, but that's about it. And yes, I have used this to attach my cell phone to and shoot um, if I um, am in an environment where this um, small tripod would be advantageous. Otherwise, it stays in the closet until I have to do a demo like this one. To collapse everything and put it back together, it's a little cumbersome. I don't like this crank mechanism, but that's how it's designed. The legs are released from being locked by loosening those clamps and then that allows me to push all the leg sections back into their housings, lock them in place, and now we're ready to stuff it in a suitcase and away we go. The second tripod I'm going to show you is one made by a company called Mi Photo. It's called the Mi Photo Globe Trotter. It's got carbon fiber legs and very lightweight construction. It's made for packing and taking hiking with you. And that's exactly why I bought it. We went to Alaska and this I was able to strap to my backpack and hike around um, looking at things, photographing things. And it really is a great tripod. I really think this would be a good choice for a lot of uh, general applications. It's not super heavy duty. If you've got a huge lens and a lot of uh, weight to support, you'd probably want a heftier tripod. But this one really works well for many things that I do. Let me show you. Setup for this tripod is pretty straightforward. You extend the legs by loosening these four knurled locking rings, tighten them up, and if your hand's big enough, you can grab all four at once and do it with one motion. Pretty slick. Yes, I really like this tripod. It's sturdy, it's lightweight, and it really is well made. The head is a ball head, much like the Manfrotto tripod. Uh, we've got a pan adjustment, and then tilt, we loosen the main knob, and then you can tilt it in any direction. Lock that back in place, of course, and you're ready to go. It also has a quick clip that uh, screws onto your tripod socket on your camera, and then it simply fits in that little groove, and it's locked in place. Very simple, very quick. There are some other features about this tripod I really like. One is something that is handy if you're on rough terrain and trying to steady the tripod. Obviously, you can shorten one leg, but that doesn't always do um, everything you need for stability. Sometimes it's nice to have one leg that can extend off and rest on a rock or the uh, park bench that's nearby or something of that sort. You can actually lock this at intermediate steps and support it on a table or a park bench, as I said, quite versatile. Each of the legs is adjustable in that way. And one more cool feature I like about this, I don't use it often, but if you take this cap off the bottom, we can pull the center post out. Now what do we have? Um, I guess you have a tripod that you can hold with your hand. Uh, no, that's not quite what I wanted to show you. What we can do is we take the leg that has the padded grip, we can unscrew it, and we can thread that back onto this carbon fiber center column. 
I'm going to shorten it a little bit just for demonstration purposes. Now we have a monopod. A monopod, yes, monopods are quite useful for photographers. If you are trying to photograph a parade and you've got people crowded all around you, not social distancing properly, obviously, but nonetheless, this is a dandy feature. Years ago, I bought a monopod, and I wish now that I had not, because this tripod converts into one, just like that. And so this is another feature that Manfrotto, I'm sorry, Mifoto, uh thought of when they made this tripod. By the way, the padded grip is not just for comfort. That is so when you're gripping this in Alaska, and the temperature is in the 30s, and it's raining and you're very cold, you will have something warmer to hold on to. So I won't show you the whole reassembly process, but I think you can understand how this tripod then collapses back together, leg sections quickly uh, fold up and we're ready to tie it to our backpack and head down the trail. The final tripod I want to show you is this one. I use this tripod for most of my studio work. It's made by an Italian company called Manfrotto. When you buy a Manfrotto tripod, typically you buy a leg set and a head separately. Heads are available for still photography, such as this one, and also video photography and other applications. Let me show you how it sets up and is used. The tripod ball head gets its name from the ball and socket joint that gives the camera a wide range of motion. On this particular unit, this knob tightens to lock that ball into place. One precaution is when you're using a ball head, always support the camera carefully when you loosen that knob. Failure to do so could cause that camera and lens to crash down and bang into the tripod, possibly damaging the tripod, the camera, and the lens. The other adjustment on this particular head is this knob, which loosens the pan feature. We can swing this around 360 degrees. It is calibrated with a little dial, which you may or may not be able to see, in degrees. And that's particularly nice if you're doing something with landscape photography. That's a simple ball head, but it does the job well, and it's very quick and easy to use. Setup for this tripod is quite straightforward. You simply extend the legs by releasing these clips, and that extends or retracts the leg section. Very simple, very easy to do with one hand. Some tripods have a different arrangement that's going to take two hands to do, but this one's much, much easier. The other thing I really like about this tripod is how sturdy it is. It's made to handle heavy lenses and heavy camera bodies, really a workhorse. It also has for video photography, particularly level bubbles that let you level the tripod so that you can pan straight across a horizon line if you're shooting video. Very, very versatile. Another cool thing about this tripod is this feature, watch. Now I have a tripod that shoots at right angles. And by clipping my camera on, like so, now I can shoot down to look at a wildflower or think about wood turning. You've got a bowl or a vessel on the table. Now you can shoot down to the interior of that vessel easily. The only problem is it's a little bit tipsy. If you put a heavy camera and lens out there, you've got a problem. Now you can rotate it and you should in fact so that the leg helps support it, but still that's pretty tipsy. Well they thought of that. What they have is a little clip on the side here that you can attach a heavy object to. Think of a sandbag, or in my case, a backpack full of camera gear that weighs more than you should be carrying. 
for most hikes, but I do it anyway. There we go. Sturdy, steady. You've got a stable, stable camera that can shoot downward into a vessel. And you've got your accessories right here where you won't lose them. Pretty versatile tripod. One that I really like. I have one more topic I'd like to cover before we wrap up our discussion about tripods. And that has to do with this little adapter clip that's used to attach a cell phone to a tripod head. It works like this. Basically, on this particular adapter, we have a threaded insert that attaches to the screw thread of the tripod or the tripod adapter in this case. And so I'm going to thread those two items together like so and fasten that to the tripod head. Now that adapter spring is ready to accept a cell phone and it'll handle a cell phone of most any size. Now remember when we're using a cell phone we need to get to the face of the phone to use the controls to compose our picture and that sort of thing and we want to make sure the lens is not obstructed by this bracket. So I'll set the phone in there like that and that's all there is to it. Simple. And so on the back the lens is accessible. On the front we have full use of the screen. And so at this point, if we want to take a video of a landscape um, of some sort, we can use the pan head on the tripod to do that. If we want a portrait, we simply tilt the head this way, and now our phone is in portrait mode and ready to shoot. So that's one of the accessories I purchased for five bucks that was well worth it. Okay, well, back to live action here. Hopefully that's given you a little bit more understanding of some tripod equipment and how we might uh, uh, choose a tripod if you don't have one. Um, I didn't talk about price points for these, but I probably should. The, uh, there we go. The uh, first tripod that I showed you was the freebie, and uh, it, you could buy a tripod like that on Amazon probably for 20 bucks. Um, it's not worth, well, I, I'll be careful what I say. There may be some good quality ones out there for a reasonable price, but that's not one of them that I showed you. Um, the uh, Mi Photo tripod, um, that one is the top end of their series because it's got carbon fiber legs. Um, I paid extra for those, as you might guess. Um, Mi Photo tripods in that series range for, probably from $100 to almost $300. Um, I did see on one of the online retailers just yesterday that that series is on sale. They've got some good deals on tripods. Um, the ones with aluminum legs, similar to that, probably were around $125 or $130. Uh, carbon fiber, you're up 250 or so, um, but you get what you pay for in many cases. But um, the um, um, Manfrotto tripod, the leg set, and the ball head are typically sold separately. That line of tripods almost never goes on sale, I'm afraid. But the legs are probably $250, and the head is probably another $150. So. Uh, when I bought that uh, years ago, it was not that expensive, but now you'd be paying about 400 for that setup. And so that's the range that we're looking at. You can get equipment much less expensive than uh, $400 or even two or 300 for a tripod. You can get a decent one for around 100 if you don't mind a few uh, sacrifices in quality or features. So tripods. Um, I think I've covered those well enough. Let's talk about some other things here before we head into the uh, studio and talk about some lighting aspects. And that's composition. Um, composition is basically where you place those items in the photograph. Uh, there are several basic rules of composition that apply to all types of photography. We're going to talk about a few of those today. And uh, 
there are others that if you go to uh, um, or take a, a class in art or design, you'll learn about some other things too. But for today, we're going to talk about some basic ones. First one will be filling the frame and kind of right along with that is simplicity. Uh, when you take a picture of a bowl or a plate or a vessel, you want to get up close and personal so you can see the details. And you want simplicity in that you don't want a lot of complicating distractions. You want the background to be void of any distractions. You don't want six bowls in the picture and try to figure out the uh, basic essence of each one. You want to fill the frame with one bowl at a time. And um, that keeps things simple. So filling the frame and simplicity are some basic rules. Um, another one that um, is common to wood turners when you talk about the golden mean and the design of a vessel is the rule of thirds. Now the rule of thirds basically says we'll put the subject off center and it's usually at the intersection of some grid lines. In fact, I think I can show you that here. Um, those grid lines define where the upper and lower thirds and the left and right um, thirds um, dividing lines occur. Now, as you can see here, let me move the cursor over here. The main subject is that round sphere that is up there where those lines intersect. And the stand follows the rule of thirds. It's basic um, vortex. Uh, what's the right word? Vertex. Vortex is something else having to do with wind speed. Uh, anyway, vert vertex is right there. The uh, vessel has, in this picture, a shadow that's cast. And part of the reason for using an offset position like this in your photo is to give room for that shadow to appear. Now, this shadow is really subtle, and you may not be able to even see it real well on your monitor. But nonetheless, that helps define the base of that um, vessel and uh, gives it a, a beginning point. Now, there are some subjects like round plates that I showed earlier that are best kept in the middle of the frame rather than following the rule of thirds. It just makes more sense to put them there and uh, artistically they look fine if you fill the frame in that manner. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is something that you should not do, and that is place mergers in your you know, picture. Now, a merger is something that doesn't belong there and it's too close to the subject. Now, this picture is my young daughter. This was probably 20 some years ago. She agreed reluctantly to pose in front of a saguaro cactus in the Arizona desert in, well, it's basically high noon with the worst possible conditions having to do with her visor and the overhead sun casting a harsh shadow and the cactus growing out of her skull. That's an extreme example of a merger. But in this case, had we gotten a little different camera angle, we could have avoided that merger quite easily. And that's one thing that you need to learn to do as a photographer. When you're taking a picture, um, I've seen this all too often, you're focused on the pretty face or the pretty kitty in the picture or the nice little puppy. And you don't realize the nice little puppy is sitting in front of the trash dumpster or a, a bunch of clutter in the background, candy wrappers or whatever. You're focusing on the subject as you look through the viewfinder, but the picture is going to catch everything that's visible by that uh, camera. And so always look around the subject for stuff that doesn't belong there. There's also another kind of merger that's common in, and this will happen a lot over the holidays, I'm sure. It's called an edge merger. When you cut off the top of a person's head with the uh, camera, you're not paying attention and you chopped off Uncle Joe's scalp. Well, that's an example of a merger you wish to avoid if you can. So be aware of those kinds of things when you're shooting pictures. Um, that's probably enough said about the merger. And if my daughter knew I was showing that picture, she might 
not come to our family gathering here this uh, holiday season. But anyway, moving along, we're going to now venture into the uh, workshop a bit and talk about some process photography. And as I mentioned before, I like to use pictures that I've taken in the workshop to document the construction of a project. How did I glue that thing together? What jig did I use to clamp that up on the uh, chuck of my lathe? And if I'm going to replicate that piece in the future, make another one or make a duplicate, how am I going to do that? And so I augment what I do with pictures with some paper notes. More recently, I've kind of tried to get away from the spiral notebooks with random pages filled with scribbles. And I'm trying to document things with some online tools. Um, one tool I use, just uh, so you are aware of some of these, is Microsoft's OneNote program. And it's basically a note-taking uh, app. OneNote is available, it comes bundled with Microsoft Office, which a lot of you probably use or have used. There's another program called Evernote that's a real popular one. Um, I haven't used that for years, but it used to be used quite a bit in academic settings. Um, with those programs, you can save pictures, you can save uh, text, you can also post YouTube videos and all sorts of things in those pages. And I find that really handy because it's available on any device that you have that can, hit, uh, that can hit the internet. So you can look at OneNote pictures on your phone, on your iPad, on your uh, desktop computer. It's always there as long as you have an internet connection. But don't want to dwell on that. I wanted to show you some of the pictures that I use to document things. Oh, let me get my face out of the way here. Hold on. There we go. What you see here are just some of the construction steps of that piece that I showed you. That, that ribbon sculpture is made out of yellow heart and sapili wood, in case you wondered. And yes, that yellow heart is really that yellow. Um, here are some steps in the glue up process, gluing the segments together, um, touching them up on the disc sander to get the smeared on glue that I, uh, need to clean off, how I clamp them up with elaborate rubber bands and masking and duct tape. Um, down here is an um, example of clamping up some sections using glue, glue blocks and rubber bands to hold things together. And then one of the critical parts, and this is something I documented so I can remember how did I do that, with a straight edge and an angle square, you can see that the wall is exactly 45 degrees um, so that all these little pieces and sections glue back together and form that sculpture properly. And there you can see how it's glued onto a glue block, glue block on the lathe and how I uh, reverse checked it to do the back side of it and so on. And then I also showed some pictures of how did I cut those bowl uh, pieces apart and then glue them, black, glue them back together. And the elaborate clamping I did with binder clips and anything else I could find to hold the pieces together as I glued it. And sometimes, in this case, this sculpture had some areas that were very difficult to sand. I ended up hand sanding some of this. Uh, but it had some tight places, so I included a picture of me running my little half-inch um, drum sander on the end of my micromotor rotary tool to clean up some of the glue squeeze out after I glued those together. And these are not pictures you would share with others necessarily, well, unless you're doing a demo to a wood training club. But uh, nonetheless, those are handy for me to remember, oh yeah, that's how I cleaned up those joints. Made it a lot easier than trying to figure out, okay, what, what uh, sanding block or, or gadget can I use to get in there and sand that area? I guess I even included what did I put on for a seal uh, a, a coat before I put on the final finish. I used shellac or a sanding sealer. And my finale here is I 
hung this thing to dry in my shower. <laughs> and I thought I'd document that. So this was a piece, if you would lay it down on a uh, plastic drop cloth or something, you'd have sticky stuff all over the place. So I showed how I did I hang it up uh, in my shower to dry. And I didn't put any of the captions here in these slides, but I think you can get the idea. Those are just some ideas that you can um, use in your creation of online notebooks yourself. So those are some tools that I've used, uh, some techniques. Um, process photos, I always try to use the best practices I can without spending a lot of time at it. For example, here I wanted to get a picture of how did I dry fit this, this uh, these are staves, technically they're not segments, they're staves. Uh, how did I dry fit those together to make sure all the joints were tight before I did the glue up? Well, I could have set that on my brown bench top that you see back here, except then the walnut and the brown bench top would kind of look the same. So I stuck that on top of a piece of white, um, this is white laminate shelving that you can get at the big box store. Uh, I use that all the time for various purposes. It's easy to uh, uh, toss that on the bench top, put my walnut piece on top of it, photograph it, get a decent background behind the piece I'm shooting. Um, tips for better process photography. I guess I skipped over what I was going to tell you here. Uh, and that's to use a tripod for the best possible shots. To be honest with you, I don't use a tripod in the shop that often. In fact, it's pretty rare. I shoot with my cell phone for convenience sake, and I'll shoot half a dozen pictures and then pick the one that's got the best composition or the best uh, 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 exposure and that sort of thing. Uh, keep in mind the background though, and try to adjust the lighting as best you can to get those better shots. So the tripod, like I said, is one I only use occasionally if I want to be in the picture myself as I'm, uh, for example, as I'll show you later, if I'm turning some wood and want to see what I look like when I'm doing that, then I've got a tripod by necessity. But normally it's a handheld shot with my cell phone. Now, the background is important. Like I showed you in that picture, uh, reproduce here again, that background really detracts from whatever it was I was trying to show in this uh, turning of this bowl. If you slip a fake background behind that though, things get better really fast. This is a simple piece of black mat board that you would mat photographs with. You can buy it at the art supply store or you can probably find black poster board or something with a um, oh, uh, foam core board. That's another one that you can get with a black surface. But sometimes black may really not be the best choice of colors. Here that sort of obscures what's going on because the tool rest and the background now are almost the same. But if you flip over that piece of mat board, it's white on the back side. And there you've got a background that looks much, much more uh, appropriate. You can see the details, not that I was trying to photograph the tool rest, that's not the point, but you can see the details, the background does not distract, and um, everything comes together much, much better. Matte board is really handy. I like to use that. In fact, one thing you can do um, if you're photographing spindle work on your uh, lathe, put a piece of matte board down on the bed of your lathe, um, I've seen people, and I've done this too, cut a hole in the mat board that'll fit your tool rest post, uh, or maybe your banjo, depending on how you want to position it, and then set that piece down on the bed of your lathe. Now you can clearly see what's going on uh, in your spindle that you're turning, and you won't have all the clutter in the background getting in the way. So background, you can do some simple things that'll make a big difference in your pictures. Another thing I do, if I do shoot with my SLR in the um, workshop especially, I will protect that camera from flying debris and dust as best as I can. Um, the first picture I'm showing you here shows a um, 
clear it looks like clear glass well it really is pretty much clear glass that is a uv filter ultraviolet light or uv um, can affect the image um, when you're outdoors shooting in a landscape uh, environment uh, not so much nowadays as it used to affect it when we shot film but a uv filter on your lens is still a good thing for protection purposes physical protection against scratches and uh, damage to the lens. All the lenses I have for my SLR have protective UV filters on them. Why do I do that? Well, that lens, that lens costs several hundred dollars. That filter costs less than a hundred dollars, which would I want to crack or scratch if I bang that lens against a brick wall or something? Well, I'd rather replace that filter than I would that lens. And so that's one reason for putting that filter on is to protect the front surface of the lens from damage. The other thing that I will do is, even though it's not sunny in my workshop, I will put on this big lens hood. Normally you think of a lens hood as being something you use to keep the sun off your lens to keep lens flare from happening. That funny glare that you've probably seen on some pictures. Put a lens hood on out in the sun, you won't have that problem with lens flare. But this also serves as another layer of protection from bumping your camera and lens against something. That lens hood is probably, well, since it says Canon on it, it probably cost $30 instead of 10, like it should cost. But uh, nonetheless, that lens hood will protect that camera I'd rather replace a lens hood than I would, again, the, the whole camera lens. So protecting the lens is an important thing to do, no matter where you're shooting. But the lens hood is a good uh, tool with which you can do that. Now, this picture is the one I showed you earlier, where we had the color balance out of whack. This shows the uh, protection of the camera from dust and debris. Actually, this is made and if you search for this on the internet, you'll look for camera rain cover. This is a plastic bag, basically, that covers the camera and keeps the rain and snow and dust away from it. And I bought these um, protective rain covers before a trip to Alaska when we uh, were going to do some outdoor shooting. In Alaska, well, it depends on where you are, but most places we traveled, it rained every day. Um, it rained every day and you could count on it. This particular bag was used quite a bit. I had several of them actually to keep a dry one handy all the time. Um, what you do basically is it's an open plastic bag that has a drawstring on one end that you cinch up around the camera lens and you can push your hands up through the bottom of the bag to get to the controls and operate the camera. And you have to keep in mind that some of the pictures I was shooting, I had these big insulated gloves on too to keep my hands warm because it was freezing cold. And so this bag though accommodated all that. Um, if you're a real cheapskate, th these bags cost a whopping three or four dollars a piece and they're almost throwaways but nonetheless they're they're quite uh, uh, reusable if you dry them off and put them away carefully if you're a real cheapskate though you can use a bread sack and a rubber band to do the same thing i guess but uh, uh, that's another good way to protect your camera from dust and debris in the workshop the uh, oh i guess <laughs> i included a couple I, I've talked about Alaska. Here are a couple pictures I shot in Alaska. Okay, we've got a humpback whale. That was somewhere in the Gulf of Alaska near Seward, if you know where that is in the southern part. Um, the uh, picture at the top, I call those the surfer birds. The surfer birds, that was in um, Glacier Bay, Alaska. Uh, surfer birds actually were following the rule of thirds rather well, I think and doing some nice uh, composition there and they're uh, floating around on that iceberg and those by the way are black-legged kittiwakes in case your bird watchers want to know that so now you've seen my travel slides 
And I see a question here coming up from Steve. Yeah, we're going to talk about the backgrounds in the studio. That's the next piece of our adventure here. Um, first, I'm going to show you a little video clip in the workshop. This one's going to focus on the um, use of lighting in the workshop and some ways you can adjust the lighting to improve things. So watch this and then we'll get into the studio. This is my workshop. The lighting above on the ceiling is the typical fluorescent and some LED uh, shop fixtures. I have a fixture above my lathe bed to illuminate the general area of the lathe. I've got a lamp here above the workpiece that I can move to see inside a vessel or on the outside. And behind me, I have some other lights that um, are above other tools around the shop. And so I'll show you first what it looks like to video with this normal shop lighting. Well, that works okay, I guess, although there are some problems with the lighting for video or for still pictures as well. For one thing, above me and behind me here is a fixture that's causing glare. This is way too bright compared with the rest of the scene we're trying to photograph. So let's turn that off and see if that makes an improvement. Now let me shoot the same uh, turning operation using that lighting scenario. Well, again, that didn't change much as far as what you saw of the workpiece here, but it did get rid of this glare behind me, and I think that's a good uh, improvement. Now, we still have some areas we could work on. Back at the back, above my sanders, I've got another shop fixture that's on and really is causing a glare, maybe even off the window from the vantage point of the camera. So let me go shut that off and see if that improves things. I will have to unwire myself to walk back there and do that. Now, I think you'll agree that looks better. We don't have that distracting glare behind us. And so let's see if that changed anything with my wood turning. Okay, well that didn't change the way the finish quality of my cut looks. That did get rid of that glare back there at the back of the shop, so I think that's an improvement. I like to experiment. I'm an engineer. That's what we do. I'm going to shut off the light that's above my lathe bed and see what changes. See whether that gets rid of some of the glare on my visor or not. Let's see how it changes as I actually do some turning here. Okay, that's probably not too bad. Um, you know, one thing we could do, if we're trying to emphasize the shavings flying off that piece, we could get pretty dramatic with this. Let's turn on some backlighting. That will illuminate the shavings, I hope, and you'll be able to see those better. And um, uh, let's just check that out. I've got a small shop light down low here. If I can do this without pulling my microphone cable loose, I'll turn on this small light that I have back behind me. And let's see if that will illuminate the shavings as they fly out. 
we're getting dramatic here. Steven Spielberg would be really proud of us for getting this far. I don't know. Is that better or not? Let's take it one more step, and then we'll call this good before I run out of platter to turn. I'm going to go shut off the room lights and leave that uh, uh, backlight on, and let's see what that'll look like. Hold on. I've got to unmic myself. Okay. Now, let's see what that looks like on video. Well, what do you think? Or do you think Delker's just in the dark like usual? You decide. Okay, well, hopefully that made the point of, of um, what the lighting can do in your workshop as you're trying to video or photograph things. It can make a huge difference. Your eye tends to correct for well, that's really your brain is correcting what your eye sees your camera is not doing that your camera is going to capture the glare and put it there in the image even though you didn't want it there and so uh, you got to remember the camera is not as smart as your brain is when your brain filters out all those uh, extraneous things the camera is not going to do that so we're going to um, find some Lighting adjustments in a shop can really make a difference. As you can see there, the um, light um, was too intense on some areas of the workpiece. Some of that glare, some of that uh, um, highlight being blown out, as it's called, when the light is too bright uh, is something you can correct. But the best way to find that out is to take a picture, look at it, and then adjust the lighting. Don't assume that the pictures in your camera are good and shut down for the day in the shop and then find out later those pictures weren't any good at all. You need to check your images as you shoot them. Well, anyway, it's time to move on to the studio. I did learn one thing today. I cannot answer questions on the chat line without it killing my video feed from PowerPoint. So I learned something new here, but uh, not something that I intended to learn. Anyway, we're going to switch gears now and go to the studio and talk about backgrounds and lighting. And uh, the, the great thing about a photographic studio setting is you have lighting that you can control and it's repeatable. I have a setup, as you'll see in a minute, that is the same lighting every day, any time of day. Why is that? Well, it's in a basement room with no windows. And you'll see um, a lot of people that do studio photography of different sorts will either have a room with no windows or it's a room that they've taped black, black plastic over the windows to give them full control of the lighting inside that room. And so I'm going to show you some examples uh, here in just a bit. Um, as we saw in the images before, the background really matters. We've uh, um, mentioned what a distraction, distracting background can do to uh, pull our eye away from the subject. Here everybody is looking at, what's he got on that? Is that a Makita drill or what? what's that thing on the stand in the back? Your eyes go every which way except to the subject in cases like that. So uh, your finished work deserves a much better background than what I've shown there. Here is an example of a background that I've seen several times, and I'm not uh, hoping I hopefully won't step on people's toes. I don't mean this in a mean way, but this is not a good photographic background. 
it looks like you put your bowl in that trash bin and it's going to go out to the dumpster soon. Um, seriously, though, that's not a real good environment to shoot a studio grade image of your finished bowl. Um, putting it on a pile of shavings may look folksy and it, it says you were in the workshop that day and that's where it came from. And that's fine, but it's not um, a shot that really sets off your bowl and gives it the attention it deserves. The lighting is not good in my workshop for, for, top, for portrait type for photography like this. And certainly if you sent a picture like this to a gallery curator, he or she would probably just toss it in the trash. It's, it's not going to get serious attention. So to get better backgrounds, we're going to have to go a different direction. And in the studio environment that I'll demonstrate here in just a bit, we'll see some different things that'll make your shots much, much better. And I think you'll see there's some areas you can improve without spending any money at all. One uh, rule for using um, a background is to keep it a neutral color. And for me, a neutral color means white, gray, or black. Um, if you noticed, and probably you didn't, but all of the slides that you looked at this morning, except for the photographs, all my slide text and backgrounds were white, gray, or black. I wanted the pictures to speak, not the gee whiz racing stripe colors in the background and all those things that detract from the images. You want the image, the photograph to stand out. And so keep that in mind, black, gray or white for the backgrounds, no hot pinks or purples. I don't care what sports team you're, you're uh, cheering for. Yeah, I have purple things all over my house too, but not in my photographic uh, shots that I'm making. We're going to look at three different uh, ways of setting up a background. One will be with cloth. Um, one will be with mat board or foam core board or poster board, something of that sort. And then one's with a commercial graduated background, which is what I've shown here in this photograph. Um, the graduated background that I'm going to show you is this one. It's made by a company called Flowtone. And by the way, I have a, a slide at the end that I'm going to share with you with the sources for all this stuff. So you don't have to write down notes and, and details. Uh, I'll have the slide and I'll also email a, a summary of that slide after the uh, demo. So you'll have all those information pieces at your disposal. Anyway, the graduated background uh, that I used measures 31 by 43 inches. It's made by a company called Flowtone. You can buy it from Amazon. You can get it from major photographic uh, retailers. I'll name my favorite photographic retailer just because they are an excellent company, and that's B&H Photo. Actually, its full name is B&H Photo and Video, I believe. Um, but they have excellent customer support, excellent uh, service. Um, no, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I just like them very much. And I'll um, mention that that's where I could buy photographic equipment when I need it. The first um, option that I mentioned is a fabric background. Um, this picture shows the uh, setup. Now I'll move out of the way here a little bit. Shows the setup using a, a roll of muslin fabric. Uh, my wife is a fiber artist, does quilts and lots of things, and uses muslin like this for a lot of her projects. Um, it's inexpensive. You can buy it at most uh, uh, fabric stores. And I said it should be wrinkle free. I confess, I was too lazy for the sake of this demo to iron this piece of muslin. And I was about to ask my nice, lovely wife to do that for me. So this is a little wrinkly. Uh, but nonetheless, it'll show how we use the fabric to form a background. Um, as you can see, I've got the muslin draped over something. Well, that something is a kind of a wooden box frame thing that my kids used years and years ago when they were in uh, high school or grade school uh, for various projects. And I've repurposed that box to be a support for my backdrops. And you'll see more of my box here in just a bit. But Essentially, the cloth forms a background. The lighting 
which we'll delve into a little more in depth momentarily. The lighting is a single umbrella lamp fixture, and you'll see some other views of that here in a bit, but that serves as the lighting source. And then the uh, uh, rest of it I'll talk about here uh, shortly as well. But you can see the light source uh, shines on the, the piece of uh, artwork that we're shooting. The camera sees that image and we'll see the results here after I show you these other two options. This option shows a couple pieces of mat board being used as a photo backdrop. Um, this works pretty well. It's easy. It's inexpensive. Uh, when you're shooting, remember that seam that you see in the background will show up in the picture. So try to position it at the rule of thirds line uh, for best effect. Uh, one option that you can use is to shoot a uh, picture with a different color background. Uh, maybe make the background light gray and the base white. Um, you could use um, gray for the base and white for the background, depending on the color of, of the um, item you're shooting. Um, uh, Steve Huffman asked a good question. Can you use the old pull down cloth or fabric window shade. Hey, that's an excellent idea. I had not thought of that. Um, commercial portrait photographers use these types of pull down, uh, not, not window shades, but they use pull down backdrops all the time. Uh, many of them are made out of cloth. Uh, some of them use paper backgrounds that are disposable. Um, pull those down from an overhead uh, uh, support and drape those on the floor and you've got a backdrop to put your family portrait against. But uh, same principle, be creative and you can come up with something that will work for you. My uh, last one here is where I've shown the uh, variegate or graduated background and I, I have a little video I'll show here in a bit that shows how I set that up so you'll see the details a bit better. But essentially, I've got it taped up to that wooden box affair and um, uh, supporting it in that way um, works quite well. I'll mention the pros and cons here real quickly. The, the advantage of the fiber or, or fabric background is that it's inexpensive. Um, now, that roll of muslin my wife has is not inexpensive, I can tell you that for sure. But anyway, a piece big enough to do a photo backdrop is just a few bucks. Poster board or mat board, a sheet of mat board at the art store is probably $10 or less. Uh, this graduated background, when I bought this, uh, I think it was like six years ago, it was about $25. I checked this week and this is now $42, but it's reusable. It's um, one that you use over and over again, and it's very, very easy to set up and get an excellent result from it. Um, I might mention there are larger backgrounds in this series. The next size up is, well, basically twice as long and twice as wide as this, but it goes for almost $80. And once in a while, I've wished for that when I've done larger pieces. But anyway, you can uh, uh, do some searching online and find some of those yourself if you are interested. Now, here's what the backgrounds look like in the final picture. The upper left, you can see the cloth background. Yeah, and the wrinkles are showing up quite well. I'm sorry, but I was too lazy to do anything about it. The uh, one in the upper right with our matte board background, it's a little bland looking, maybe a, a gray background for the vertical piece would have been better. But hey, I used what I had at hand and that worked out okay. And then the one in the bottom, same light set up, exactly the same exposure and everything has a much more dramatic effect, a much more pleasing effect, I think, than the other two. So. As far as backgrounds go, there you have it. Questions about that before I show you a quick video of the uh, studio setup and how we uh, pull those things all together. Doing okay? All right. I'm going to, again, get my face out of the screen, 
shut off my microphone and we'll start the video. Welcome to my photographic studio, also known as a ping pong table. This particular place in my finished basement does not have any windows. That makes it ideal for photography. I don't have to worry about outside light sources interfering with the quantity and quality of the light that's entering the room when I'm trying to shoot photographs. That makes a big difference in consistency. I also have the advantage in that I can leave this mess set up all the time, well, until the holidays come and the kids come home and want to play ping pong, then I have to clean up a bit. But at any rate, this is an ideal spot for photographing my wood turning. And I'm going to share with you first some lighting techniques and then look at backdrops and other details. Until recently, I used compact fluorescent lamps like this one in umbrella fixtures like you see here to illuminate the work that I was photographing. These work great for photographing the quilts and art pieces that my wife was creating. I also use them for wood turning. Recently, I found that there is a much better way, at least I think, to photograph wood turning to give it more depth and show the shapes of those pieces. And that is to use a single point of light like we have here and reflectors to reflect the light back from the other side of the piece. And I'll show you that technique in a moment. These compact fluorescents were good compared with incandescent lamps because they only produced a small percentage of the heat that incandescents would. This one was about 165 watt equivalent, only dissipated 45 watts of actual power. More recently though, I found that there is an LED equivalent. That's this bulb that you see here. This particular one was one I purchased at Home Depot. It's a 300 watt equivalent. It only uses 35 watts of power made by the Fight Electric Company. I'll show you how it works. I warned you, this one's bright. There, that's enough. In a moment, I'll show you how I use this light source and a reflector bouncing light back from the other side to properly illuminate pieces that I'm photographing. Here's the basic lighting setup. As you can see, the light is to the left of the subject and camera, and it casts a shadow to the right of the subject. For a reflector, you can use a simple piece of mat board or poster board or foam core board, similar to this, or you can use a gadget that I like, and that is this multi-purpose reflector. Watch and be amazed. On one side, we have a white reflector. On the other side, it is gold color. And wait, there's more. Inside is one surface that is shiny aluminum foil color and one that is translucent nylon fabric for using as a light diffuser. And so this particular reflector can be used in a variety of ways. The other nice thing, it has a handle so you can hold this and adjust it with one hand. And I even have a little clamp gadget that will clamp this onto a tripod head so I can adjust the light and leave it there, um, that serving as my assistant that doesn't talk back or get uh, fidgety when they've been here too long. Anyway, I'm going to use this reflector to show you how we would use the uh, reflection of light back onto the subject. And so if you can focus your eyes or focus your attention rather on the plate and the shadows, I will see what I can do with this reflector. This view shows basically what our camera will be seeing. We can see that Behind and to the right of the plate is a shadow cast by the plate. To fill that shadow in a bit, we can hold our white reflector there and reflect some light down into the shadow. Now the effect will vary depending on the position of the light, the angle of the reflector, and so on. 
Another interesting trick that we can do is turn the reflector over and use the gold side. Now, as you can see, or I hope you can, there's quite a bit of warm light being cast back into that shadow. That might be a real interesting effect, or it might just ruin the picture. I don't know. One thing I do see is right along the rim of the plate, there's a very nice gold highlight that's being reflected back. That detail could add some real punch to that picture. Now that we're finished with our reflector, I'm going to show you how we put it away. It's much like a bandsaw blade. You grab it on each end, you twist, you turn, you pull it together into a circle, and now you've got it. All we need to do now is figure out where I put the case. I see it. And once it's in the case, we're done. The nice thing compared with a bandsaw blade, there are no sharp teeth to get involved with my fingers. There we go. All wrapped up, finished, ready for another photo shoot. The background that I use for most of my photography is this one made by a company called Flowtone. This particular one ranges from what's called thunder gray at the top to white at the bottom. Normally, the dark color is placed at the top with the white at the bottom, although I have reversed that. On some uh, subjects that have a lot of white in them, I find that the dark color works well as a base to set those items on. I use this wooden box as a support mechanism. A lot of people make elaborate PVC pipe frames with clamps and all sorts of gadgets. I find this primitive method works quite well. In fact, one problem with using clamps is the likelihood that you'll scratch this surface. This material is a plastic material with a matte finish, and that matte finish absorbs reflections real well. But it's also very sensitive to being scratched. And once you've scratched this, you pretty well ruined it. Well, unless you like to do a lot of post-processing in Photoshop to touch up those spots, and I don't. So I typically tape it together like you've seen here. That allows me to move this back and forth to vary the curvature depending on the type of vessel I'm photographing. As I said, this is very vulnerable to being scratched because of the uh, matte finish it has. So when you place a bowl or a vessel on this, you do not slide it back and forth. You pick it up carefully. And um, that's one of the only precautions that I would um, suggest. This type of um, background is also available in a paper material from various companies, but that material is almost a one-time use uh, material because of its uh, sensitivity and likelihood that it will be wrinkled. This heavy plastic material should last for years, provided it's not scratched. And that's what I have to say about that. And don't ask me why I Put that last piece in there. I guess I was just tired of videoing. <laughs> anyway, I am. Um, there we go. Get out of the line of your text on the screen. I am going to encourage you now to think about what's next for you in your workshop. Um, explore how you could use photography to document things. Um, we haven't talked about a lot of topics or. Uh, numerous additional workshops we could do on uh, things like how to safely preserve your images. I urge you, if you don't have a way of archiving your work safely, please do so. I know too many people that keep all of their photos on their cell phone in their pocket. If you lose that phone, unless you have some sort of online um, backup storage going on, you have lost everything. 
I always keep at least two backup copies in two separate physical places and online uh, just to make sure that those images that are so precious to me won't disappear. Um, there are lots of opportunities to um, find places like that. Some services automatically back up photos, but be careful because some online online backup services don't back up the full resolution of your file. They may back up um, basically a, a thumbnail version of it in some instances. So be careful when they say they automatically back your, your images up. The other thing we haven't talked about that is something I do a lot of is what's called post-processing of those images. In other words, editing those after you get them um, after you get uh, those images with your camera. Um, I use Photoshop a lot for my uh, processing of those images. Photoshop I use as a subscription service. And yeah, it costs money. It's um, almost $11 a month. Mm -hmm. My justification for that is $11 a month. That's cheaper than Netflix or cheaper than a lot of these streaming services that I don't subscribe to. And so anyway, Photoshop is one tool that's commonly used, but there are many others that are free. Um, my uh, son uses a very similar program called GIMP, and GIMP is a, uh, an open source program very similar to Photoshop. It's not quite as polished and smooth as Photoshop, but nonetheless, it's a very capable uh, editing program. Some of you may have bought a camera that comes bundled with some um, photo editing software. And many of those are really good. And even the cell phones now will have features that uh, let you do some correction to your images before you actually share them or print them. So those are some things that we haven't covered, but I encourage you to explore on your own. And above all, I'd really encourage you to share those images with others. I'd like to see what you're doing. I'd like to see if what we've covered here today makes an improvement in your uh, picture taking and using those for wood turning. We've talked about a lot of things today. We've covered everything from uh, getting familiar with some equipment and terminology, camera settings, uh, lighting, composition. I know we've covered a lot of territory and covered a, a, a fair bit of uh, ground that you may not have wanted to know about necessarily for your wood turning purposes, but I think it may make you aware of what's going on when you get that picture and realize that, oh, if I had uh, changed the lighting setup, this would have been a better shot. I'll do that next time. That's what I'm hoping you'll do with your camera. And above all, I hope you enjoy photography as I do. It's, it's something that's challenging, it's interesting, and it ties in so well with lots of other pastimes and hobbies. I encourage you to learn as much as you can and enjoy the whole process. So I guess that's about what I had to share with you today. I hope there are questions perhaps out there that I could answer. Yeah, that's one of my segmented uh, sculptures in process and it looks like a sanding disc that I wore out in making that. Any questions you have at this point? I must have covered everything thoroughly. Really good demo, David. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, we will have, as I said, a, oh, I guess I've got a slide with the resources on it, but I will share this resources in my, my head right in the middle of it, hold on. There we go. Um, the equipment I use or some other things I probably don't have on the list, I'll try to include in a, handout, I'll email to everybody. Um, oh, somebody asked, Steve asked about a soft box. Yeah, um, the lights that I used in the studio are called uh, umbrella lights or umbrella fixtures. A soft box is used for a similar purpose. It's basically, a, well, if you think of the umbrella, the best description I can give you without showing you an actual picture is, take that umbrella, turn it around, put a translucent cover on the open side of it, and then turn on the light to illuminate the uh, subject. 
it's basically a fiber or, or sometimes they're plastic with a fiber uh, front surface that has a, a lamp inside to illuminate your, your work. And the advantage to a soft box, sometimes those are um, a little more uniform in the lighting distribution than is an umbrella uh, fixture like I used. Uh, the umbrellas I used, by the way, I bought years and years ago on eBay. They're dirt cheap. I mean, I got four of them plus a bag and the reflectors and all that for like 60 bucks. They're more expensive now if you buy them from Amazon. You can still buy one or two umbrella lamp, uh, fixtures like that for $30, I would guess. You can probably get a couple of them for $30 or $40. Uh, but a soft box is a little step up from that and one that I probably should be using. But hey, I've got umbrellas that work OK, and that's what I'm using. Uh, David, uh, I think that a little more emphasis could be put on the fact that a lot of the errors that we make in taking the pictures in composition, lighting and all that can be taken care of when you get to the computer afterwards and start uh, enhancing them, changing your contrast, changing your lighting and the composition and all of that, that uh, for those that don't do it, can't do it on the camera, they can go to the computer and correct a lot of those errors. That's very true, Victor. I, I Almost every image that I use for any purpose, I'll drag it into Photoshop, crop it a little bit, tweak the lighting. Um, in serious cases, if I don't want that person's uh, head to stick out into the view, I will get that out of there and fix it, if you will. And so um, that's a real great tool to be using. I see I've got my video off here still. Hold on. You can even sharpen them up. Yes, there are quite a few uh, improvements you can make um, in that way. Let me get back here to there. My snow scene is going to come back to you here momentarily. Ah, there. The uh, Trying to get you back on the screen now. Oh, that's my, I'm sorry. I'm messing around now trying to get the right window to open with my, there we go. I'm sorry, a little technical difficulty here in the uh, studio. Um, I was trying to get the chat window to expand and that's not the right window. I wanted the full, full Zoom window to open up. Anyway, other comments or questions? Hopefully I've hit upon some things that will help you in your picture taking. So many times I hear people say, I just don't know why this camera doesn't do better. Well, the camera is doing fine. It's the way you're using the camera that needs some uh, adjustment. So hopefully my uh, suggestions and examples will help out. Yeah, David, David. excellent job. Uh, I found uh, in my... Uh, trying to learn features on more advanced cameras is that uh, if I don't use it very often, I'm back to zero trying to remember how, what I learned before. So I guess a person needs to, uh, to keep reviewing and keep those fresh in your mind you want, when you want to use them. That's a real good point, uh, um, Terry. I was trying to remember the voice is familiar. I don't see your picture or your face here. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. My mind's about shot today. The uh, uh, thing you mentioned is real important. My camera has a manual that's about a half inch thick. And as I was preparing for this demo, I thought, oh gosh, what if somebody asks, what's that other button on your camera do? I don't know. I never use that one. The nice thing about the internet is if I want to know how do I do live screen view with uh, selective focus by touching the screen, I can Google what I just said and I'll have that page in the manual in a few seconds. It's, mm -hmm. it's easy to find, but if I start looking at the manual, it's, oh my gosh, it's back here under advanced features and controls, subsection, you know, uh, very difficult to find. But, Reviewing that once in a while is a good thing because, oh gosh, I wish I would have remembered that when I was shooting these 
particular scenes, I could have used that feature. And so definitely good advice. So thanks for that, Terry, good idea. Hey, David, this yeah. is Ray. Yeah, Ray. Um, my question relates to uh, when you present the pictures, if you happen to have multiple pictures and you want to use them in a setting, I'll just say like in the news newsletter, and you want to kind of make them a little bigger so people see more of it. What's the rules of thumb in terms of covering another picture, being in the background versus the foreground, as far as representation to the viewers? Um, one thing that I'll do, or you see me do probably when I um, do the show and tell slides, I'll have the main, I'll hold my hands up here, I think you can see them. My my background screen is not full screen here. So I'm trying to figure out where to hold my hands. Sometimes I'll put the central subject and the lesser important pieces smaller and overlaid underneath the corner of the main image. That was probably a terrible description of it, but you can put multiple pictures there and then overlay them, tile them. And sometimes that will give the effect that I think you're asking about. So you can still see those other images, but they're less important than the main one that's the focal point. And maybe when they get to show and tell, I can drag some pictures around on the screen and, and give you an example on the fly of that. Well, is it acceptable to, you need to at least show the whole, the whole piece or can it, corner of the piece be cut off by the dominant picture? I would say it sure could be, yeah. In fact, many times I will take a detailed shot, by that I mean a, a real close-up shot of some uh, texturing or carving or something on the piece that I'm making and make that the full image or maybe just take uh, a, uh, you know, a here, I'm trying to draw on the screen and my hands aren't in the right place. Instead of the whole image, just take a portion of it that you've captured and enlarged to the full screen um, to emphasize that detail. And so, yeah, I think covering up part of it is acceptable. Uh, you know, the rule about mergers and not having an edge merger are important for some subjects, but others, maybe that's a good way to uh, um, bring that image up close and personal to whoever is looking at the picture. Thank so, you. Sure. Any other questions out there? One yeah, thing. Uh, I, another note, David, is uh, you talked about a lot of rules for composition. Uh, also, keep in mind as you play with photography and you get more advanced, you'll learn when to break those rules as well for the artistic value. So. So for, for a beginner in photography and you're just starting to learn, those rules are very good guidelines. But as you advance, you will learn where to, to disregard those rules. Yes, that's a real good point, Todd. The, the rules are there to get a person started and for most purposes, those work well. As you pointed out, like the rule of thirds. Many times that's a good thing from an artistic standpoint, but sometimes you just have to not do that because you need to fill the frame with the image or you need to deviate from it for, for a different reason. Uh, and then there are a lot of other composition rules we did not talk about for landscape photography, you know, framing and leading lines and some of those things that you may have heard of. But for most of what we do with wood turning, we probably don't need those um, uh, necessarily. So good questions. Any others? I would encourage you to um, experiment a little bit. And please, I invite you to share with me any questions you have. If you like me, you'll think of the good questions as you're daydreaming this afternoon, watching TV or whatever. Write them down, email me, call me, text me, whatever you want to do. I'd be happy to 
discuss it with you. I love talking about photography, in case you didn't know that, and think it's a great uh, uh, pastime that meshes together real well with wood turning. And so I hope you'll explore those things as well.